All right. Uh, I'm here with Sang Lee, uh, CEO of Dark Matter, and now currently the Project Constellation. Um, thank you for being with us at Token Post. Uh, we were interviewed you last year, I think, uh, towards uh, July. Right. Uh, we're glad to be here. Uh, we have uh, a lot of questions for you. Uh, I think there's a lot of updates since uh, last time. Yep, for sure. So just to go over uh, some of your things uh, that you're doing at Dark Matter, yep. uh, you just uh, launched Dark Wallet yes. on July 1st. Right, right. So can you tell us a little bit about Dark Matter uh, okay. shortly and about Constellation? Sure. So Dark Matter is a fintech platform that's headquartered in New York with offices also in Ukraine, Shanghai, and Seoul. Uh, we focus on the alternative asset space to streamline the fundraising process for venture capital funds, private equity funds, and hedge funds. And then we provide access to those products to investors all around the world. And to tie that back to Dark Wallet a bit, uh, as you mentioned, Constellation is a new company that was formed under Dark Matter to create a blockchain infrastructure for all of financial services. Right now, Dark Matter is running as a centralized platform where our company is the clearinghouse for these new products. We think there is a future to tie in all of these, uh, these services uh, via blockchain technology, provide self-incentivization, um, and Dark Wallet is the means to interact with this new infrastructure. So they can use our token, which is DARC Dark, in order to stake their tokens to provide new financial products or new services and also generate new revenue streams in the future, as opposed to just providing technology infrastructure like we've seen in the past. So you mentioned about some of the service providers and you told me earlier about that through Constellations, the service providers could uh, be their own nodes. Um, can you tell us maybe some examples of services and uh, why you think they should uh, be on Constellation? Sure, absolutely. So even if you think about financial services today, right? When you buy a stock from a bank or you deposit money into a bank, it seems very easy, but in actuality, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. There's a massive global infrastructure that allows you to take out money with your ATM card from the United States, right. and they connect seamlessly through the back end, right? But these connections are very linear, and they're very, very expensive. And there's no incentive also for them to just stop sending money to you, right? That, that's just a contractual obligation. But under Constellation, what we think is that these service providers can actually plug in so that customers have more choice and more power in how the system is actually run. So there's an incentive to kick out bad actors, for example, or folks that are not efficient in running the system. And just to mention a few of these services, let's think about custody. So one of the hottest topics right now in the industry is tokenization of assets or securities. Uh, it's a sexy topic, but in actuality, it's very difficult to do because no one knows how to hold it. You can't hold a certificate. You can't put a token in your pocket. So people are very worried, how do I keep this secure? How do I not lose it? What, is, what the heck is a private key, for example? So people are asking for custody solutions, but custody solutions are fragmented right now. You have to go to the custodian and then somehow set up a relationship so that the tokens can be shifted there. What if that becomes a part of the infrastructure like we're thinking about today, which is a blockchain-enabled infrastructure, not just software-driven, so that people are incentivized to do the best possible job, provide the best possible services, but also be incentivized to act well. We've seen in 2008, we've seen in different instances in finance, people aren't incentivized to act well. They're incentivized to take your money and run almost right now. So in a blockchain system, if we think about it the way Bitcoin works, for example, you're actually incentivized not to take the money and run because it would make the system go to zero. And that's basically what we want to build a constellation. Um, so you're targeting the finance market. Yeah. So finance, in my opinion, goes hand in hand with the regulations, and Correct. rightly so. Uh, what are you doing at Dark Matter to overcome this or at least uh, uh, work with the regulations? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, I think the one unique advantage we have is that dark matter was born of regulations. So we actually started the company by talking to regulators with the SEC, with Congress, to deregulate under what we call now the Jobs Act. So crowdfunding wasn't a thing in 2010, 2011, and we thought it was impossible. How would you deregulate private securities? How do you put things on the internet? People literally said, that's illegal. We're never going to do that ever. Now, fintech and using platform for distribution is 100% fact. Everybody knows it's, it's mandatory. 
The big asset management companies, they know they have to use in the internet to reach new customers. So I think there's a definitely a learning process there. I think what blockchain slash cryptocurrency has a hard time understanding right now is that we all need to play nice with each other. That doesn't mean we always have to listen or we have to follow the rules of someone else. But I think there is a, a coordination and a cooperative effort that needs to occur. So when we talk about Bitcoin being you know, against government and you know, for the people, I think it's, it's a great concept in theory. But in, in, for most regular people, like I said, they don't want to hold Bitcoin. They might lose it. What if you give it to someone and you lose $100,000 worth of Bitcoin, you have nowhere to go, so you ask for a custody solution. Custody solutions will be regulated right. by the government. Like, so there's always like a tie back eventually. Um, and I don't know how the regulations will evolve, but I think for us it's much more important to be cooperative so that we can move faster than just kind of you know, breaking shit and moving on. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to so, uh, finance, yeah. what, what Part of finance is your initial target, the funds, the, the banking. Mm -hmm. um, can you share a little bit yeah, about your sure. focus? So uh, we think of the, the spectrum of finance that starts with payment and currency. So I think currency is actually outside of finance because currency is in the realm of pure economics and central banks and, and like kind of macroeconomics. Econo I think once that enters the system, which is the payment system, then it becomes a part of financial services as a currency. So if we think about the one spectrum of being uh, payments, then I think the far end of being the most structured complex products that you know, hedge funds trade and banks buy, et cetera, to de-risk themselves. Um, where we're going to start off is where dark matter lives. So we think about the private fund universe, okay. which is about $20 trillion right now, but it's very, very small compared to other asset classes. And it's the hardest to distribute. There's no way right now to distribute it seamlessly to other people. Like an investor in Thailand can't invest in a US private equity fund. It's pretty much impossible. Um, there are regulations as to, that says that why that is, but it's more about cost, really. Why does a private equity fund want to spend more money selling in Asia when they could just do it cheaper in the United States, right? right? So you automatically disincentivize uh, people to act in the best interests of the community. But what if you can level that playing field a little bit, and which is what we're doing at Constellation, so that the funds can actually sell cheaper and they're incentivized to go global. Now you can democratize um, investor access to new products. That's just the beginning though, right? We pick the hardest one because we're gluttons for punishment. Mm -hmm. But if you think about stocks, bonds, more liquid assets, they're liquid already. They move in big exchanges, they're global. You have ADRs, et cetera, but they're still inefficient. When you IPO, you use bankers, right? Or right now there's direct listing, Slack did it. But those, those assets are liquid, but I think in the future they'll all be tokenized. And then you're gonna build in regulation and it's gonna be super easy to do. So that's the spectrum that we wanna go down. The most difficult, and then start going down to the easier stuff. <laughs> Talking of finance, uh, recently you've seen, uh, I mean, incredible numbers in yeah. derivative trading of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, you, we talked about it just earlier, BitMEX and CME, mm -hmm. they just reached, I think, daily volume of 1.7 billion mm -hmm. uh, and BitMEX ten, tenfold. Uh, why, why is this? What, what's your opinion on this? Mm -hmm. Is this healthy for the industry? Mm -hmm. uh, what should we expect from this? Yeah. So uh, even in traditional markets, the derivative markets are much larger than the actual notional assets. Um, and the, the, the fact of the matter is by nature, because it's derivative, it's, it's much bigger because you can leverage it. You can uh, you know, multiply your returns or your losses very, very quickly. Um, I think it'll only continue to grow. I think it'll only continue to grow at, you know, at speeds we've never seen before because I think we understand the derivatives market, which is funny, better than we understand Bitcoin, right? And finance people that can make derivatives market are not Bitcoiners. They're pure finance folks that are able to make these new products. And that's just kind of tongue in cheek because I think there are products that haven't been made which are necessary for Bitcoin to succeed, ironically. So uh, if we think about Bitcoin as an actual currency or store of value, uh, there's no way that a, a sophisticated or a professional investor or even a rich investor can take a long position on that without being able to hedge it. 
There, there needs to be some mechanism by which I can hedge my risk out if it goes down. Dollar, yeah, you could probably go long, but dollar, you go long $10 billion. If you're wrong 1% on that, you're gonna lose $100 million that day, right? So it's the magnitude by which this thing trades, but in the logical sense of the word, yes, long Bitcoin, you know, you know, forget the bankers, et cetera, I get it, but in the rational sense of the word, if I'm gonna take a $10 million position on Bitcoin, I need to know that if it, this thing goes to eight or seven, I'm hedged so that I end up with a million dollar loss, for example. There aren't enough products to protect that risk right now. Yeah, um, yeah you can do Bitcoin futures, but I don't know that many people that can trade futures. I, I barely understand this stuff myself. I mean, um, because it's almost like the more complex the product becomes, ironically, the easier it is to consume. And that's basically what Wall Street's really good at, right? You make a product that's easy to consume and to take a position in. Futures is not easy to take positions in. I have to track 30, 60, 90 days. I have to make sure I have enough collateral. I have to like sit there and trade. If somebody creates more volatility products on top of that, which is just like an ETF, I can just buy it, like a currency ETF. I can just buy it, and I think that's why the market will continue to grow, and it's gonna help adoption. There will be losses, um, but it's going to help adoption. And I think Asia will be the biggest consumer of derivatives. And it already is, in, in my opinion, and I think that's driven by the propensity for high risk, high return. So at the moment, this volume, great volumes yeah. in the derivatives market, the Bitcoin derivatives yeah. market, uh, who are the main players there? Yeah, so obviously CME, you know, that's the regulated part of, of the world. Uh, there's also BitMEX, um, which is kind of sitting in a grayer area, uh, but they've been absolutely dominating the market for Bitcoin futures, you know, providing 100x leverage, and uh, they did, I think, 16 billion notional in one day. Uh, they're doing absolutely you know, um, uh, outrageous amounts of volume, but it's really driven by demand. I mean, it's not like anybody went around and said, you, know, you should do this, right? It's, uh, they thought it was a great idea, and everyone you know, likes to think that they're the smartest trader. Uh, <laughs> but I'm sure people have been blown out, and I'm sure people have made a lot of money. Yeah, for sure. And in the beginning, um, I heard Arthur speak in, in Taiwan, uh, people were complaining that BitMEX was a scam because people didn't realize their contracts were closing. So they wouldn't close it at before the 30 days so that the whole thing would just expire. And they didn't realize that, wow. which is why they actually made the perpetual contract. So you can just be sit in there forever as long as you post collateral. <laughs> um, wow. Um, let's talk about Libra. Yeah. Uh, that's the sort of the news. Yeah. Um, and I think they're meeting at Washington. Yeah. Um, I know you've been part of Jobs Act, yeah. um, working on it in crowdfunding, equity yeah. crowdfunding. Uh, what are your thoughts? And w some people, some conspiracy guys are saying this is all a show. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, what are your yeah. thoughts on Libra? What do you think the, the U.S., the government, the SEC, and governments around the world will react to this? Yeah, I think Libra is the, the, the gorilla in the room, right? The elephant in the room right now. I think um, it's interesting because I do have multiple facets of thoughts about it. One being, I think it helps adoption, right? The moment it, you know, it went out, people are like, what is cryptocurrency? Google, or check it on Facebook, yeah. right? Like, so I think that's the one thing. And it's, it's been happening to me too. My friends are like, oh, Finally. what's Bitcoin? Should I buy Libra first? You know, it's like, all right. So it helped a little bit. I think having said that, I'm of the, like one of my philosophies for blockchain or anything in general really is incentive alignment. It's not about whether I'm right or you're wrong. Mm -hmm. It's about can we have incentives aligned so that we can cooperate. Consensus. Yeah, or even collude, if you think about it in a negative way, against somebody else. Mm -hmm. I think in the case of Libra with a basket of mixed fiat-based you know, stablecoin currencies, that poses a huge risk to government, right? Um, because they're gonna pick their baskets, and they're not part of the 27 oh. nodes, et cetera. And there's a huge conflict of interest between those two parties. Mm -hmm. I don't know what dealings they're gonna have in the back room, mm -hmm. but if there's an incentive alignment, mm -hmm. maybe it occurs. I think ironically, uh, the difference between the Jobs Act and this thing is it's a global fight, right? About, about the so sovereign nations and, and their own tender currency. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think that's an issue. I think r from a regulatory standpoint, it will be very difficult mm -hmm. um, to get done. I personally am not a huge fan mm -hmm. that Facebook will be controlling my money. Mm -hmm. um, 
There's a great quote that I just saw because of July 4th in the United States. So Thomas Jefferson was obviously a big economics thinker, one of the earlier bankers for the United States. And he wrote in one of his early quotes, if private banks were ever to be able to issue, inflate and deflate their own money, and people use this, our families and their children would wake up to realize that they were homeless and broke. Wow. We can never give private banks the power to control the, the, dis, the manufacturing and destruction of currency. Wow. And it just came to mind because of Libra, mm -hmm. right? It's literally a private consortium of the world's most powerful companies mm -hmm. inflating and deflating currency. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Is it unavoidable? I mean, it's inevitable, is it? isn't it? I think it is inevitable to a certain extent, but I think there are systems that are better designed uh, for punishment for bad behavior. Mm -hmm. So in this case, Facebook, yeah, he, they only have 1% of the vote, but no one else knows how the other governance right. works. Right. They may have 1%, but maybe there's triggers mm -hmm. that you know, makes them increase more. And who's to say they don't collude with Uber and, and whoever just to change the governance consensus in the future? So I think it's very, and like who's elected Facebook and Uber? Like nobody did. Um, so I think that's one thing. But having said that, I do believe in a semi-centralized system. I think that's the only way that this kind of plays out on a broad scale, but not for currency. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I think, if you think about store value or currency, right, if you think about um, Bitcoin as a store of value, I don't think that should be semi-centralized. I think there's, there should always be mechanisms to decentralize as much as possible. But in reality, it's semi-centralized. We know where the mining hash power is. We know who has the most Bitcoin, et cetera, et cetera. But they can't change it. That's the interesting part. They can collude and do a 51% attack. But once that happens, you would never trust that system anymore. So there's kind of a natural incentive never to do that. Um, POS is the same thing. It becomes useless if you attack it. So uh, I think... There's the, the way I think about um, the world for blockchain is that there's two layers. Mm -hmm. One layer is this pure mainnet slash currency layer, mm -hmm. which is value times technology. Mm -hmm. And that's it, right? That's the future of things where currency becomes one and the same with technology. Mm -hmm. Then you have what we used to call the DAP layer, but I don't think that's appropriate anymore, where you put in real world services through the blockchain, mm -hmm. where that needs to be semi-centralized. Mm -hmm. Would you want a neighborhood guy who owns a restaurant checking whether your stock is legal or not? No, absolutely not. You'd want a guy with a lawyer or Kim and Chang to check that this is legal to buy and I'd be happy to do that, yeah. right? And I'm happy to pay mm -hmm. to do that. So I think there are systems where no one should control it, especially when it's non-fungible. Like money is non-fungible. Mm -hmm. There's no reason anyone should control that. But in case of more specialized services, I think we're going to see these layers form. It's like the HTML world versus Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. Amazon is huge, but they don't control the internet. Yeah. But Amazon is where you do everything, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's similar to where we're evolving now. Let's come back to dark matter. Yeah. So what is your goal? What's your roadmap look like in the yeah. next year, uh, yeah. this year, next year? Yeah. Um, what do you focus? Uh, mm -hmm. Which market? Uh, we mentioned, we talked about which product. Mm -hmm. Which market are you focused on, yeah. and why? So uh, for dark matter, um, the parent company Korea is a very big market for us. Uh, Korea has been facing, in the most positive way, the most explosive growth we've ever seen in any other country so far. Um, and NPS, as an example, is set to grow even further. You know, in the next two years, and it's. It's becoming a problem. It's a, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy of wealth and success where you're too successful for yourself, right? So you need to figure out ways to deploy capital to preserve wealth. Um, and we hope to become a main catalyst in providing that service. So, so the financial institutions, the investors, they can find the right products to deploy into. Um, on the roadmap for us, we're going to decentralize ourselves. So uh, Dark Matter will become a node on Constellation, a uh, date to be announced, but we'll be one of the nodes on Constellation. Um, and then we'll be onboarding other financial services uh, firms as well as platforms that provide different services uh, so that we can complement ourselves um, and provide a better suite of services uh, through Constellation. So okay. look forward to that where we decentralize ourselves. <laughs> Do you have a timeline? Within the year, for sure, uh, but probably sooner than that. 
Cool. Yeah. So, well, thank you, Sang, uh, for joining us here at Token Post. Um, we look forward to seeing you grow and see what you're what you're doing in, in the next ventures. Thank awesome. you very much. Thanks, Sang.